Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. And today we are joined by Grand Falls Deputy Mayor Jose Rio Walker. Grand Falls is a picturesque town renowned for its stunning natural beauty and vibrant community spirit. At the heart of the town lies the majestic Grand Falls Gorge, where the powerful St. John River cascades over a series of rugged cliffs, creating a breathtaking waterfall that spans across the entire river. Now, beyond its natural splendor, Grand Falls boasts a rich cultural heritage and a diverse range of recreational opportunities. Visitors can explore the town's charming downtown area filled with quaint shops, cafes, and restaurants offering a taste of local cuisine and hospitality. Outdoor enthusiasts can enjoy hiking, biking, and fishing in the surrounding wilderness, while golfers can tee off at the nearby courses. Now, throughout the year, Grand Fall hosts a variety of festivals and events that celebrates its heritage and community spirit, including the Grand Falls Winter Carnival and the Harvest Festival. Whether you're seeking adventure in the great outdoors or simply looking for to unwind in the picturesque setting, Grand Falls offers a warm welcome and endless opportunities for exploration and discovery. This is Cross Border Interviews with Deputy Mayor Jose Rio Walker. Jose, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today and talking about yourself and, of course, my favorite subject, and that is municipal governance and local <laughs> governance as a whole. And I want to start, if you don't mind, by starting uh, getting to know the persona behind the deputy mayor's title. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Jose? J Jose? I am, well, I guess I, they say that I was born a leader, <laughs> but I, uh, I need to give credit to my mom. Um, my mom was always very involved in the, her community at different levels. And um, also, I worked uh, for most of my career in economic development uh, for the region here. So um, I understood from early on the importance of um, municipal governments in um, it, it's the one that's closest to the people, right? So they, I find that they have the greater power in changing things uh, within the community. Um, so yeah, I it took me a while, <laughs> but um, I finally decided that um, why not me? And um, it, it was fairly easy for me as well to go into because I was very aware of, of many of the local issues and. Um, and uh, really went in in it with um, the good um, intentions, if I could say. But yeah. So I, I, the one thing I try to do prior to my interviews is try to find the electoral history of my guest. And that's the only yeah. background that I try to do. So from what I gather, the first time you put your name on the ballot is in 2016. Is that right. correct? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I want to sort of ask this sort of basic, stupid question, but what Why? was going on in 2016 <laughs> that you said, you know what, it's time for me to put up or yeah. shut up and put my name on the ballot. What was going on? I appreciate that. <laughs> um, actually, it was a by-election, so it wasn't even at the regular election. I didn't even have the guts then uh, to do it at the regular e election. But coming back to my mother... My mother passed away in May and the elections, the regular elections was in May. And um, so, I mean, timing wasn't good in May for sure. But in November, uh, the by-elections, I said to myself, you know, why, why not? You know, just do it. And uh, we had um, back then in 2016, it was for the village of Drum. And as you know, the province went through amalgamation. So it changed, uh, dynamics changed since then. So uh, in my small village, um, there wasn't too many people that were running, uh, hence the by-elections, right? So um, there, it was getting problematic and um, I spoke to the mayor at the time. I said, you know, this is who I am. This is how I like things. 
done. <laughs> and um, if you think that um, I'm a good fit around the table, I'll run because, you know, I'm not going to go into something where I'll be uh, stopped and put uh, have me put the brakes all the time. You know, I want to, if I'm engage, I always engage 100% in whatever I do. So if we're on the same, don't uh, gardon, as we say in French, same mindset, then I'm going to run. So that's really why. <laughs> so the reason I asked that question is because um, when I when I type your name into Google, there's a few things that pop up. Mm -hmm. That's scary. Your, <laughs> it certainly is. I I know the feeling. The one thing I noticed though is since your uh, election in 2016, you have been a strong proponent of getting more women in leadership yeah. roles. Yeah. And I kind of want to ask the sort of follow up to that is. Yeah. Now that you're in a leadership role, do you yeah. kind of feel like you have to uh, bring more women into the field because you are yeah. seeing it as a more male dominated field? And I'll be the yeah. first to admit that when I look at the state of uh, women in municipal politics, it is a more male dominated field. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, I do believe that not just because I am a woman, but seeing the conversations around the table when you have women around the table it's very different and um there's a social aspect to it but there's also the respect aspect to it and um you know i, I hate to say it but most women are very busy uh they you know they run a household they have a full-time job and all that stuff and they do the the volunteer work i still consider municipal work volunteer work because we're not really well paid and um so i mean we don't have really the time to lose i understand that men are the same but when we go there it's because we want to have things done we we uh, we don't necessarily go into politics because we're thinking of the elections in four years. That's the sense that I get from most uh, municipal uh, women leaders. Um, most of us we go in because we want change. And I yes, my job, uh, which is actually finishing in in uh, at the end of March, but my current job is actually this uh, leading a leadership project to encourage more women to engage in uh, decision making roles, whether it be politics or board of governors. And um, I find that being a municipal elected official, I I can give um, the, the the encouragement and feedback, and and because we need reassurance, um, women need reassurance. We need to be you know okay the, to be told that yeah you can do it, and that's just the way we are. And um, so I feel that I, since I am uh, in a leadership role, that I can, you know, preach um, <laughs> this, and um, and I find that it's it is important. Um, I, I know people will say, well, they have uh, women have as much, um, um, uh, you know, they're as much allowed as men to run. Of course, but there are barriers and people need to recognize that there are barriers. And um, so we are 50% of the population. Should, so we should be 50% sitting at the table. So, so the reason I asked that question, and I, I know we usually talk about yourself, but I think this is a passion of yours. Yes. Um, I want to go back to that 2016 election by election yeah. for you. Yeah. And I, I Give me some real world context here. What was the barriers that you saw in front of you prior to putting your name on the ballot? Because you so eloquently yeah. said that you spoke to the mayor and you dive in 100%. You don't do anything yeah. half footed. So what was the barriers that you saw that you put in, you put in place yourself to say, OK, should I, shouldn't I? And then ultimately say, OK, you know what? The barriers don't matter. I need to do this because I think I'd be the best person. Yeah, there's always that little person that sits on your table uh, on your shoulder here that says are you good enough you know and um uh, we call it the imposter syndrome um <laughs> and uh you need to overcome that and it's 
it's I find that it's more difficult for women to overcome this because of the many um, challenges we face. I mean, I I was I'm 54 years old. When I started in economic development, I was 25. It was a men men white haired man led industry. So I always had had to you know work harder to for people to recognize my worth and value so i felt that it was the same thing be in uh in the municipal world in my village um the there was the we had a uh, former woman mayor but there was never a woman counselor never Okay. So, yeah, I know. So, I mean, you go into, and in, you were talking about a small village, you know, it's very rural here, agricultural, and, you know, so you have many, um, many. Um, everyone um, knows everyone, I'm assuming. And everyone oh, and knows. No, of course. <laughs> and there's a lot of préjugés, uh, like um, people that um, think a certain way and not necessarily open to new new things. So you know that you're getting into an area where you still need to battle. Uh, you still need to make sure you make the extra effort so um, uh, they understand how it's important to uh, be equal, to be inclusive and all that stuff. Um, and I find that we fight the battle of all minorities, <laughs> being Francophone and a woman, you know, there's, uh, but um, there's certainly other uh, people that have more barriers than I do. I'm still white and I'm still privileged. Um, but um, it's, it's going into an area where you know you can do it, but are they going to appreciate what I have to say? And uh, is this going to be a battle? I appreciate that. Yeah. I, I kind of have a follow up to that because now yeah. that you've been on council for almost eight years, yeah. first elected in 2016, and then you it's now 2024 when we're recording this episode for anyone who's listening to this later on, eight years. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 is it what you expected? Looking back on the last eight years, was municipal politics what you expected? And can I ask you to give advice to the potential first time candidate, the mm -hmm. person who is thinking about putting their name on the ballot? Because as mm -hmm. we're recording this, the province of Nova Scotia, the province of Saskatchewan, Northwest Territories, the Yukon are all heading to municipal by elections or municipal elections this year. And there might be people listening to this saying, I'm not sure if I should run because I just don't know what is in titled into the position of being a councillor, a deputy mayor, or even a mayor in a small town rural community? Yeah. Um, like I said, I mean, it's a part time job. So um, <laughs> are you sure about that? Are you yeah. sure about that? Because sometimes <laughs> it's full time. Sometimes it's full time. Um, I mean, it, it you have to go at it saying that you're you're committing your time. If you don't think you have time, then don't run. Um, and I see around the table some counselors that are don't necessarily have the time because they have other commitments. And um, it, it's not necessarily a good thing because around the table, everything the, everyone needs to pull their, uh, their, sh their fair share. Um, in the smaller communities, we get, I, I, I didn't expect that we were as involved as we are <laughs> um, because, you know, we have less resources, less staff. Um, I thought that we would ha be handling like upper level uh, decisions and the execution of that would be someone, someone else. So I was surprised about that. So if we do execute, that means you need time. So don't go into politics if you don't have time to commit. Don't go into politics if you don't have that support system. I've always been involved and my husband has always been there for me saying, you go girl. And uh, my children as well. Um, my kids are now all adults, so they don't rely on me, which helps. Um, 
but it's not as not easy if you have young children and uh you have meetings at night and things like that it it changed a little bit since covid you know doing uh meetings through uh zoom and teams it's allowed now it, it, it use it wasn't allowed before covid you had to be present at a municipal uh, meeting now it's allowed so you still like I travel for my work, so if I need to be away, I can do that. But you need that support system at home that will be there for you because it, it is a lot of time. But if you are a minority, I deeply um, recommend and encourage you to run because we need uh, our um, elected um, tables to be as diversified as the country is. And uh, so we need to give space to new ideas, um, um, either be a woman, in, uh, indigenous, uh, newcomers, immigrant, all of that stuff. And I find that it's very important that uh, you do decide to go if you are um, a minority because we need, to, we need to shape up, we need to do better. I want to talk about the role of council for a few minutes before we yeah. turn to the uh, the town as a whole. Yeah. Um, I can imagine eight years into your job, you've had to make some very tough decisions, particularly during COVID-19. But yeah. now after COVID, we have the sort of financial situation that every Canadian is facing right now. Yeah. How do you know you're doing the right thing for your community? When you go into that council meeting, you have to have a sense of where the community as a whole is but at the end of the day they don't get to vote on the issues you yeah. are the lone vote that goes in there with your council members and votes on issues how do you know you get it right for the betterment of your community yeah well you need to put yourself in the position of your client you know we're there for i, I call them clients and, and um we're there to represent the citizens so we need to not forget who they are and um, there are many issues that come up uh, on table but you need to say to yourself you know what's the priority what's most important now in these circumstances and it's so difficult to plan ahead um um during these times because things change like this um you know we're, we're just coming out of a strategic planning session which is great because you get to consult citizens and ask them you know what would you like to have and then that is very important um i think every uh, municipal council needs to pause and do that consultation even though it is time consuming and uh but um you need to remind yourself why you are there um and also you need to give yourself time um and i know we've been rough because we've been with this new uh regional municipality uh just ongoing for a year now and we're saying, well, we haven't done this, we haven't done this, we haven't done this. Yeah, but we've been at it for a year and we've done this and this and this. So, uh, yeah, I mean, um, most citizens um, are OK um, and they do respect um, you and they do encourage um, you to pursue. Um, you always have people that don't understand the process and they want always you uh, for always you to do more but i think if you coming back to what i was saying if you are there for the right reason and um are there for what the citizen um wants the priority then you'll do fine um budget is always a big consideration and like we say to our citizens like your household, you have a budget. It's the same with us. We do have a budget and we have to stick to it. And it's very expensive uh, to run anything now, including a municipality. So um, we have to make difficult decisions, but it's like I'm, I'm a communications major. I know how important it is to communicate the message and transparency leads the way I 
I govern. So um, as long as you are transparent with the people and explain to them why you make this decision instead of that one, then people will understand. Okay, so you, you've mentioned a few things that I want to play in the sandbox for a little bit, but I, I know I'm cautious of time, so I'm going to try. <laughs> I I'm talk try. a lot. <laughs> no, I appreciate that because it'd be really bad if you did. So <laughs> you, you mentioned one thing that I'm very passionate about, and that is communications and communications yes. with the residents or as you uh, so eloquently said, clients, because they are yeah. your clients. Exactly. As a former communications person for a municipality, I know you can communicate till you're blue in the teeth yeah. and make and try to get to as many people. But there's always going to be people who say, I didn't know. Oh, I yeah. didn't know about this yeah. or I didn't hear about this. Yeah. How do you communicate? Yeah. So you're not just communicating to your base, your group of people that you know, but to the people who may be apathetic, who may say, as long as my water's turned on and my ga my garbage is picked up, I am content with what's going on at City Hall and I don't need to be in the weeds. I'd rather pay attention to what's going on in my life. Yeah. How do you communicate to everyone so that way you know that people are understanding what's going on at Town Hall? Yeah, it's very difficult. <laughs> very difficult. Uh, we're questioning this um, on a weekly basis because we don't have a local paper anymore. Uh, we have a, a few a local uh, radio stations and we're fortunate for that and we use them. Um, but social media, I mean, uh, of course it's important. Not everyone's on Facebook. Um, I find that the best way is being present um, you know, going to Tim's, um, doing uh, sort of town halls and uh, participating in local activities where you uh, you see people that you wouldn't normally see, uh, festivals and things like that. Um, I think that is important for a smaller community like ours, for sure. That's the can, way that, uh, yeah. Can I interject on that for a second? Yeah. Are people willing to give you their opinion on issues? I find, and this is me saying this, this is not the deputy mayor. So if you have any yeah. emails, send them to yeah. me. <laughs> I find that there's an apathy in this country when it comes to municipal mm. politics. I'd rather pay attention to provincial politics or federal politics. But like yeah. you said, you are the closest to the people and you make the yeah. biggest impact on the people. Yeah. In your community of Grand Falls, do you find that people are willing to actually give you their opinion on issues that are facing the community? Um, yes, most oh. of them but a lot of them do, and uh, we have we have started to create a citizens committee around issues, um, which I find that is important. For instance, I was leading a committee. Uh, the, the town has a municipal building that has hasn't been working it used to anyway we want to change the vocation of that building and so we, instead of us around the table making decisions we created a citizens committee and people I, I i saw people afterwards they say if ever you do a committee like that i like to join in so yeah um so we try to create um uh, committees like this of people that know a specific topic that like more aware and we bring them together and discuss and um uh, it's it, it's proving okay but most people don't necessarily know the difference between municipal provincial federal governments who does what you know and i know from knocking on doors and uh and when you're running um you know they get confused with education health it's always a priority but they don't necessarily understand what the role is of a municipal um uh a municipal uh, government so there's a lot of confusion with that but i mean it's not up to us to to uh try to teach them um politics 101 and uh civics 101 um but it comes back to understanding their concerns and if they do have concerns regarding education or health then um, we have close relationship with these elected officials and uh, it's our responsibility still to bring these um, um, issues to uh, the, the proper um, proper authority so um, yeah I, so I, 
I appreciate that. And I appreciate you talking about the jurisdictional roles because it's another mm. area on this show that I talk about a lot, but I am cautious of time and I want to talk about the town as a whole. But okay. before I ask this question, as I always do, I'm going to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the deputy mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not yeah. a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is the deputy mayor's opinion and her opinion alone. She has one vote on council. Yep. That's all she gets. Yeah. Deputy mayor. I'm going to use that term because I'm using this. I'm asking you this as the deputy mayor. In your opinion, mm -hmm. what do you believe is the biggest issue or mm -hmm. issues facing Grand Falls today as mm -hmm. of recording this episode? Mm -hmm. It's financing. <laughs> um, with the new... Uh, I, I, I know you've met with other people um elected officials from new brunswick and i'm sure this has been brought up uh, in government the past. reform are you going to talk about yeah <laughs> so um it's rough I, I have to be uh very frank with you because i find that um we we've been told some things and um the uh let's go to the the there's a I, I can't translate that in English. So anyways, the boots doesn't follow the lips. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The words are not coming out. Those the, the words that are not matching up to the words that are being said. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I mean it was a di very difficult budget process. Um, the most difficult that I've been through um in the last years, even with the transition committee. Um we we have this new municipality that we need to govern and we have projects and we've been telling people just wait, just wait, you know, give us your uh give us your um your vote and we'll make it happen. And, you know, uh, it's not easy for small year communities to, to join um, larger communities. They always have um, the feeling that they're, they're being um, eaten by the larger ones. So um, um, we want to respect the, the, we call them wards now, the small, the former municipalities are called wards and we want to respect their priorities but this larger uh, community or the larger um, municipal uh, entity has probably larger, um, you know, needs. And um, we just can don't I, have the I, funding. Can I, can I interject yeah. there for a second? Because you bring up a good point because you represented the village of Drummond prior right. to the amalgamation process. Right. If I'm not mistaken, in 2022, the amalgamation process went through and then 2023, January 1st, it's sort of the new town of uh, Grand Falls was created, correct? Yeah, it was later than 2022, but yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. But I, may, yes. I might be getting my dates mixed up. I apologize for those who are no. listening. So just follow along with the question that I'm about to ask. Exactly. You come from the former village of Drummond, yep. but you now represent the new town of Grand Falls. Right. How hard is regional it? Regional municipality. The yep. regional municipality of Grand yep. Falls. How hard is it to forego the thinking that I am now a village of Drummond counselor and now I'm the deputy mayor of the regional municipality of Grand Falls, because you know that you can't look at every issue as a Drummond issue or a Grand Falls issue. You have to look at it only as a Grand Falls issue. Right. Is it hard when you are so close in your rural yeah. community of Drummond that you're now looking at everything as, as a larger picture? Yeah. You know, I went from 743. Um, citizens to close to, I guess we're close to 11,000. So very different for sure. Um, and people are just, seems to me that people are just waiting, giving us the benefit of the doubt that it's all going to work out. We were kind of lucky in our area here that um, like the, the outside smaller communities were more rural and the Grand Falls town, former Grand Falls town was more of the hub where they get their services and things like that. So we were already collaborating on 
many levels. So men is, so it's not as difficult as it was in other jurisdictions in New Brunswick. I recognize that, but in French we have esprit cloché. You know, in the smaller communities you have that church. <laughs> and and uh, people that convene around that church they still within their mindset of the smaller community my way of thinking is um, being transparent to them and saying listen we can't do everything and that's why the, um, the strategic planning process was very important and we went in these individual community committees uh, communities to uh, feel what they want and everything um, and if you look at it uh, uh, hindsight is they pretty much share the same needs and wants um, maybe a little differently within their own jurisdicts jurisdictions but um, it, it's very similar um, but it, it's not it's not easy but it, you do it by earning the trust of uh, the citizens and making sure that around the table you always tell the rest of the gang what about drumming don't forget drumming what are we going to do there and it, we need to make sure that um, we always question that you know what about what about what about and um, and no, that's the way I try to do it right now. And um, I think people re do respect that. You, you talk about the financial strains yeah. that you're, the regional municipality is under. Yeah. And I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but I kind of have to. So that way yeah. people <laughs> go away with a little bit of a silver lining. Yeah. Give me some hope. Give me some hope that the regional municipality is not in a financial place where five years from now, they might have to dissolve and be amalgamated into something yeah. else. Give me some hope that the path that you are going through right now, while challenging, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Well, I mean, uh, you need to run this as a business somewhat. <laughs> and yeah. um, you can only do what you can afford. Um, and try to um, continue tr trying to tell the provincial government and tell the feds that we need financing for specific projects. And I think that's the way things will run from now on. Um, they won't give you just an envelope, say, do what you want with them. You're going to have to be creative as a as a uh, municipal council and develop projects and seek financing for uh, these projects. A bit like we're seeing with all the housing issue right now. Um, I commend the, the federal government to um, be willing to give funding directly to the municipalities and not go through the provinces as they've done in the past with uh, the agreements they had. And that could be rolled out in other uh, aspects as well, either economic development, could be infrastructure, it could be tourism, it could be other uh, other avenues. So um, we need to to change the way we work internally and um, be these project developers. Yeah. So, so uh, before we turn to my last subject, which is tourism, and I yeah, love the fact yeah. that you kind of segue there, but I'm going to ask you one last question. Now, the financial state of the municipality is a very macro issue, very big picture issue. But if I go talk to 100 people in Grand Falls tomorrow, they will give me some very individual issues, very yeah. that pothole, that sidewalk, yeah. that street, that library. I need a new pool in this area. They want a pool. They want a pool. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> wants a pool in municipal government. I don't know why, but maybe the federal and provincial government should be in the business of creating pools for uh... municipalities. How do you balance the needs of the community with the needs of the individual? Because when you collect tax dollars, property taxes, you want to make sure that people feel like their taxes are being spent on their issues. But you know, and I know that you only have a limited supply of money and you're not going to be able to afford everything. Is it hard to balance what people want with the realities that municipalities are under? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Um, yeah. Nice and simple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is because sometimes they don't understand necessarily um, the undercurrent of a pool, for instance. Okay. Um, it's very expensive to run um, and they build it and they will come. <laughs> that that's the old way of thinking you cannot run a municipality that way anymore even though like way back i remember they there was a lot of money for these types of infrastructure but there's no money to uh support the running of them right and and that's what's expensive i mean the salaries and uh and um and pools never Pools always operate out of net loss. I don't care yeah. what municipality yeah. you are in. They always yeah. operate out of net loss. Ice rings, pools, and stuff like that. So you have to get your money somewhere else. And that's what we need to um, explain to our citizens that it is a business. I mean, we cannot um, go over budget um unless that we we know that the funding will come from somewhere else uh, but everything is uh so expensive right now we have a new municipality we don't have a sign that even says the name of our municipality you know because we can't afford to put signs on the highway they're too expensive you know yeah. So, um, there, but, hopefully, um, there's something that says uh, the regional municipality Grand Falls when I arrive there because I need a photo of your sign or something with your logo on yeah. it. Yeah. Um, at town hall. Yeah. But not on the highway. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> um, but yeah. Go ahead. You know, well, Grand Falls, uh, it's the fall. So that's easy. Yeah. Exactly. Easy enough of a backdrop. Yeah. So I want to turn to my last subject because I'm cautious of time here. And yep. I want to ask a very poignant question because as I've said on this show, if you come on this show, I come to your community. I am okay. doing a massive swing through New Brunswick oh, in uh, okay. 2024. So that's okay. why I'm trying to gain as many uh, communities before I get there. So I can go meet with you in person, hopefully okay. grab a coffee at your local Tim Hortons and grab a sign photo. But then I guess you don't have a sign. So grab a, <laughs> so a photo of Town Hall or the falls. What are some of the tourist destinations in your community that you recommend? And I say tourist destinations, I don't mean the things that you are known for. What are the hidden gems? What are the things that you're like, okay, if you come here, you have to see this. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, even though we're called Grand Falls and Grand Sou en Francais, um, you know, we're the first uh, uh, officially bilingual uh, community in New Brunswick. We were the first. Moncton decided to do it afterwards, but that's why we have two incorporated names, Grand Sou and Grand Falls. So, yeah, fun fact. <laughs> So learn something uh, new every day on this show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um we uh, obviously we have the falls and the falls um uh they um they they, they generate uh, a lot of visitors so we have tourist attractions around the falls but mostly the gorge. So the gorge uh, is right in smack in the in the town and um so we have um walk paths and um, we also have an interesting um main street it's called the broadway boulevard and the boulevard was constructed um because it used to be a military base, you know, and how they do the parades around the boulevard. So we kept that intact. So from for people that are driving here, we know they're tourists because they don't know how to drive the boulevard. It's, it's, we know the locals find it very funny, but uh, it is confusing. But it's Challenge a Challenge accepted. I'm getting there and I'm driving the boulevard. <laughs> So, um, so it, it is a very pretty spot. Um, and also on the falls, we have uh, zip lines that cross the falls. The best time, I don't know when you're uh, planning to come to New Brunswick, but the best time to come really is in spring when snow melts, ice melts, then you have really, really, really nice falls because there's a, um, 
a dam at the falls, right? And they control the uh, water um, flow uh, because of the dam during the summertime. But the best time really to see our falls is in the spring, April, May. Um, and uh, well, with the, the weather we're having right now, maybe earlier. Um, so, um, and also I might, it's- I might have to try and get out there for May then. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure, your first stop. Um, and uh, we, um, I mean, uh, hunting, fishing, all that stuff, uh, for sure, because we, um, uh, we uh, also have um, access, our um, major arteries in town are open to quad. Um, yeah, so quad can write <laughs> right, wow. right yeah yeah um so that's so, particular as well where do you go after a long day of council meetings yeah. after a long day of work where do you go in the community to decompress to let it all go because you know tomorrow morning yeah. you're going to be interacting with residents and dealing with issues yeah. that your municipality faces yeah i live in a field so i go <laughs> outside and um during covid i have to uh, tell you that um Right before COVID, I lost my job and we were contemplating maybe leaving the area here and COVID made me appreciate where I live more because I am from here. I went to study, but I came back. So, I mean, um, sometimes you always think it's better somewhere else, right? So we actually thought of leaving and um, because we were stuck at home, I learned to appreciate where I live more. And um, even my children, when they come back, they say, it's really nice here, mom. I said, I, I do agree with you. And um, so I am in my garden and I have a huge greenhouse and garden. And that's that's the perks of living a rural life. Um, you get to do that. Um, and then uh, we have a local brewery. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's a fun place to meet. Um, and um, walking around town, Broadway, there's a lot of uh, people that just do walk. So it's the outdoor life. Um, we do have, you know, cultural events, festivals and things like that, for sure, that I like. But for me, it's the outdoors and it's the smell it's the smell of the potatoes. Uh, when they plant the potatoes, when they uh, pick the potatoes, and when the potatoes rot. <laughs> <laughs> so we started by talking about you on the show. We're ending by talking about the regional municipality of Grand Falls on the show. So I've got to ask the million dollar question to end this interview. And that is, in your opinion, Deputy Mayor, what makes the regional municipality of Grand Falls such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Yeah. Well, during COVID, there was a large influx of um, residents from Ontario that chose our municipality, like other areas in uh, Atlantic Canada, as you as you know. And um, I asked them, you know, why? Um, and they do say because of the bilingual um factor of the community I mean, it, we are officially bilingual but we're about 70 percent francophone 30 percent english um so um they appreciate that the location is great i mean even if we're rural we're uh three hours and at three and a half hours to quebec city three and a half hours to moncton um three hours to bangor maine so um it's kind of uh, a good area to do business and to live um, because we're in proximity to the larger centers. If you do uh, decide to, you need that extra flavor of, um, I was in Quebec City a few weeks ago. So it's easy for us to, uh, to travel because we are in a great location. So we have the rural life, but within a uh, proximity to other centers where we can get that Costco feed when we need it. <laughs> Jose, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. This has 
This this is the perfect way to start a uh, morning off, and I can only imagine that you have the best interest in your community after only talking yes. to you for just a, a less than an hour, yes. and it seems like you are doing it for the right reasons. So thank you so much for taking time and being part of the show and talking about the regional municipality of Grand Falls. It sounds like a fantastic community, and like I said, I'm looking forward to be seeing it up close and personal later this year. Well, I appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to uh, having a beer with you at the Grand Falls Brewery. <laughs> Thank you so much, Deputy Mayor, for sitting down with us today. If you have found this episode sparking your interest, hit that follow button now. Stay in the loop with all the diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth cross-border interviews to our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and maintenance of the top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last few years. Now, if you can, please consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in amplifying the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.